that darkness Shadows knew where I started When my demons incarnate Move with passion, I brought it Yeah, I brought it, then I caught it Okay, so vintage lenses on Lumix or new mirrorless cameras in general Finally, the world has been opened up to being able to use old school vintage lenses on modern day cameras i mean technically we could use them on the old dslrs but there was kind of a limitation to what lenses could be used what lenses couldn't be used finally though with all the brand new lens mounts we can just throw majority of old glass on these cameras which has got me onto my own little series because i've collected i've got a box over here and i've counted 35 vintage lenses some of those are duplicates you know sometimes you end up buying job lots and keeping two of the same lens um but a lot of them are all kind of unique lenses i've never heard of very very rare lenses but the character of these lenses are fantastic so this series is going to be about just popping those vintage lenses onto these modern day cameras and i'm using a lumix s5 for this particular video to start with so right now you're seeing me on the kit lens of the actual s5 and the lens we're going to be talking about today is this one here which you've probably already heard about in the intro to this video this is the mc flectagon it's a carl zeiss lens it's a 35 millimeter and i believe it's an f2 f2.4 this thing is kind of a bit of it's quite iconic there's quite a few videos out there you'll see of this it's a bit of a, a cinematic beast this particular one um is a bit broken my copy is a broken one so let's Let's just put that as a disclaimer for this particular review. Mine is locked wide open. So if you like the footage, if you think it looks nice, if it looks clean, then bear in mind the copy you'll be getting <laughs> should close down. The irises should close down. I think something's happened on the inside of mine when it got knocked, um, but I need to do some sort of repair on this one. But the whole of this video will be shot with this thing wide open. I have not put any ND filters or any kind of filtration over any of the lenses that we're reviewing. So it should be just like the raw image coming out, but I will have to obviously adjust ISO and stuff like that to get the right levels and values. Anyway, let's dive in to the review. The first section I'd like to talk about is the build quality and you know size and shape of this vintage lens. Now you'll see when you take a look at the deflector gun, it's not a big lens, right? It's a lot smaller than modern day lenses. It feels like all modern day lenses are quite large nowadays, whereas this one is really, really petite if my camera would even focus on it right now. I don't think it's even trying, is it? <laughs> oh well, we'll show some B-roll on that. But really, really petite lenses. Uh, they always fit in your hand kind of thing, whereas modern day prime lenses, they seem to be absolutely huge, especially if they're giving out the same amount of light as this thing. This thing will also fuller, <laughs> fuller. This thing will also cover a full frame sensor, which is amazing. So if you're looking for a small light kit, this will work. Also, when we t twist the barrel here, do you notice that the actual barrel has minimal movement on the focus wheel when it spins around? That's something to bear in mind if you're attaching a follow focus to your camera through rails. You don't want the lens to be shifting too much where you know the focus ring is spinning around because obviously that can come off the cogs. This does have some movement in it, but not a lot of movement. When it comes to the actual focus throw, it's quite a long throw on this one. It feels more like a cine lens than it does feel like a photography lens. You know I mean, there's quite a bit of throw on there. So that will feel nice with a follow focus. And its weight, pretty hefty but it's build this thing is absolutely built like a tank even down to the the grooves of the grip it's a proper grip this isn't some rubber that's been attached to the lens at all it's a real like carved out metal groove system there so if anything this will just wear away and the the paint will come off it but um yeah it's not rubber it's not cheap it's not wearing away like some of my other vintage lenses it's a solid really nice well built lens so in terms of price, I think these lenses now, you can get them on the used market from anywhere between say 100 pounds to 300 pounds. The price seems to be a little bit erratic and all over the place right now. When I picked this up, I think I got this for about 35 pounds, 40 pounds around that mark. Um, and I didn't know that it was defective. I don't think it was when I first got it, but yeah, I dropped it. Now it's got a little bit of a rattle to it. And I think that's, Maybe some issue. Maybe you guys in the comments would know how to take this apart and get it fixed pretty quickly. If not, it may go on eBay pretty soon. 
or maybe a competition. I don't know. Leave a comment below, see what we think. So the next section will be covering the visuals of this lens and it gives you some absolutely beautiful footage. But before we're gonna talk about that, I just wanna tell you guys about a new product that I've just released on my website. It's called Cine Log Convert. One thing a lot of us filmmakers really want is to get our cameras looking like the big Hollywood cinema cameras. There's lots out there that promise to make your footage look like the cinema cameras that are out there. And yeah, a lot of those get pretty close, but where it starts is actually in the log. Take for instance, this image right now. This is V log coming out of a Lumix S5 II and this is how it looks. Now let's put on Lumix's Rec 709 look. Now this is exactly how the Rec 709 look from Lumix looks on a Lumix camera. What a lot of people suggest is to use a look called nicest look. This comes with the Lumix cameras. It's kind of like something you can download from Panasonic. So let's switch over from the 709 to the nicest look and see how that one turns out. So that's kind of the look that we're getting right now. But what I want to do is take it all the way back. Let's go back to the V-Log. Let's go back to Log. Now, is there a way of transferring the Log from this camera into another camera? Turns out there actually is. And it was very, very, very long winded to do so. And I'm going to make a whole video about how we did that, the behind the scenes kind of thing. But let's just show you something right now. We've managed to transfer V-Log, what you're seeing right now, into something called C-Log3, which is what you find in ARRI Alexa cameras or ARRI cameras. Now to the naked eye, this may not seem so different. And we're gonna do a side by side. We're gonna have V-Log on the left side here and C-Log on the right side. It may look very, very similar. All it's doing is taking the color science from the ARRI Alexa and implementing it on top of the color science of the V-Log. Basically, you know when you go into Photoshop and you get all the hex colors and you can see what the hex code is for green, every camera sensor will have that built into them. So all you need to do is get the code of how does the ARRI see green and how does the Panasonic see green and you kind of need to match the difference so that they match together. Then you've got the color science of one camera on another camera. And then if you want to do that for a Sony, you're then going to do the same, but then cover the difference for that camera. And if you want to do it for another camera, you've got to get the same kind of code again and translate that to another camera. And you keep going and you keep going until you end up with the product that we've made. So now that you've seen you can change your V-Log into C-Log, what's the finished effect looking like? Is it really that different? Well, once again, let's go all the way back to V-Log on the left, C-Log on the right. Now, V-Log to Rec. 709 from Panasonic on the left, C-Log to ARRI Rec. 709 on the right. Do you see much difference? It is very, very subtle, but now you are in the world of ARRI. When you look closely, skin tones look a little bit different. The green on his hat will look a little bit different. Let me just move left and right so that I can cover both fields there. Maybe this top may have a different tone on it. But I feel once we've done this, like at first I was like, is there any difference? Are Lumix cameras actually that close to ARRI? But when I looked really close at it and when I started using ARRI LUTs from ARRI's website on this particular conversion, it looked absolutely amazing. So if you just want to kind of match up to the Hollywood cameras, if you want to feel like you're sitting in the world of Hollywood cameras, if you can't afford a Hollywood camera, an ARRI camera, but you'd like your footage to kind of feel how theirs feels from the start, then give this conversion a try and see how you get on. It's not priced too, too high. I think it's just right to get you early filmmakers into the game. Like I said, we'll dive into a full detailed version of how we managed to do this later on, but I just wanted to show you guys something new that's gone on the store, which may be very beneficial to you guys. And it's not just for Lumix cameras, it's for Sony, it's for Blackmagic. It's also been put onto the iPhone 15 Pro. So go check it out, link in the description. Okay, so let's talk colors. This lens actually renders a really nice tone overall. I feel like there's a lot of contrast, especially for a vintage lens. This lens seems to retain a lot of contrast. A lot of my other vintage lenses, they seem to just lose out in the shadows. The blacks aren't really retained, but this one is really nice. If you get it right, the greens look so deep, so rich, so beautiful that it really makes the image pop. 
Not to mention skin tones are carried over very, very well and handled very well in this. I feel like there's something about this lens that is quite magical. I can understand why a lot of people are out there trying to search for this lens. It has a kind of cinema feel to it. I mean, mine stuck wide open, right? So it's yes, it's rolling off. There's a lot of bokeh in the background, but even though it's doing that, it doesn't render a soft image. It's kind of like an image that's detailed enough to kind of have a character to it. And that's why I've still used it on many projects, even though it is fixed wide open because it's such a beautiful lens. It's kind of prompted me to buy a secondary one that's actually fully working and then try to get this old one here fixed. But yeah, in terms of the colors of this lens, I really enjoy it. It's really rich, it's really vibrant and it's really true to life. I feel like there's not too much color grading you need to do after the fact. If anything, you just bring in some of the saturation back because the saturation is really, really rich in this thing. And then we can move on to the sharpness of this lens. So I can't really 100% tell you, yes, this lens is super sharp because like I said, mine's trapped wide open. So mine's always at 2.4 uh, on the f-stop, but you can see from the footage, you can see from the files here that I'm still getting a nice detailed image. So you can imagine when you do stop that down to say F8, F11, this thing will naturally sharpen up. It's just kind of the way it goes. Um, so yeah, I can, I, can, I can see how this will have potential to be a nice sharp lens but also have very beautiful characteristics. And talking about characteristics, look how this thing rolls off when it comes to the bokeh in the background. It's absolutely beautiful. It's very cinematic, especially for a 35 millimeter lens. What I did do as well at the same time, I recorded some shots with the Zeiss lens. I also recorded some shots with the kit lens at 35, just to show you kind of what the difference between the zoom kit lens would be at its lowest F stop at that. I think it was around F4 or something around there, um, compared to obviously the F2 of the Zeiss. So I'll put those side by side or I'll do a before and after on those. So what I think we can do next is if I actually grab the lens, which I've got right down here, take off the kit lens that we've got, put this lens onto the camera, and then we can do some tests with flaring and things like that, just to see how it looks. Because when I was doing my outdoor test for flaring, it didn't like to flare that much. And that's one thing I would say, if you're looking for kind of those cinematic flares, this may not be the lens to do it, but let's see, let's test your opinion. I'm gonna put this lens on right now. As you can see, we are now completely punched in, completely overexposed. And no matter what I do, you'll hear the clicks maybe. It's just not changing for me. So we're stuck wide open. What I'm gonna have to do is adjust the camera, obviously, because you can't really see me right now. Then I need to make sure we're in focus. And then I think maybe I might have to pop an ND filter on there to do the rest of these tests. And then we can move forward. So unfortunately, I could not find an ND filter thread size to go on this lens which is a bit of a pain. So what I've had to do is I have to bring the ISO levels all the way down and I had to change my shutter angle to a 90 degree in order to get the light in what I would say as optimal. Do you know what I mean? So this video may look a little bit jittery for this section here, but hopefully it works. So first things first, let's talk about, obviously we can see the skin tones on my skin here, the way it's rendering tungsten light in the background, the white light on the screen which looks all right. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch the torch on on my mobile phone here so we can see how the flares kind of work. You can see that it kind of looks like there's a, a halation naturally over the light. And I think that's kind of a, it's just a vintage lens kind of thing. So, but as you can see, there's kind of no, as I'm moving this across, there's not much natural flares going on. You know what I mean? Even if I got this real close here, it just doesn't like to flare that much. I think it's done really well. Whatever coatings are on this thing, seems like it's so well done that nothing really happens. That is so wild. I can't believe nothing. <laughs> it's just dead to flares, no flares. Look, hold on, what we got? Oh, did we get something? Oh, look, there you go, there you go. A little bit of a flare. Look at that. I had to get it so close. Jeez. Minimal flare, if I was to do that from any other angle. So there you go. If you're looking for a, a lens that has full of flares, very vintage sci-fi kind of look, I don't think this is gonna be the one for it. But where this lens trumps is in its colors, and what I think is, is in its close 
focus format. Let me just show you how great this thing covers close focus. So let's get this out of focus so we are ready for close focus. There we are. And I'm just going to get right up in the camera now. Focus about here, right? no. So the minimal focus on this thing, really nice. If you're trying to kind of get some detailed shots and throw out the background, you can kind of do it. And as you can see, the background is fairly blurred on this thing. It's, it's pretty nice. Obviously, it's at 2.4 stuck wide open. What do you think? Nice, huh? Let's go back to the kit lens. This is the kit lens in the same focal length. We are now if he wants to focus on me, let's get us in there. We are now at 35 millimeters at F 3.5, I believe that's saying. But as you can see, that's how the background's blurred out. And this is the renditioning of the skin. I guess I have to get to my rating scheme for what I'm gonna do for this whole series. So for this Carl Zeiss Flectagon 35 millimeter F 2.4, I think I'm gonna say I like this lens enough to give it a 8.2 out of 10. 8.2 out of 10. I like the colors out of it. Uh, I love the contrast out of it. I don't like the fact it doesn't flare enough. I love the size of the thing. And I think the close focus and everything can give us some really nice detailed footage. And it does look cinematic but I just wish it had a little bit more flair to it and I wish it had a little bit more weird character because the bokeh is really nice in the background but it's not like swirly or, or anything like that. But I really like this lens and I really think if you're a filmmaker, you should definitely jump in, dive in and get this lens. Definitely worth it. I think even if you pick one up for about 150 pounds, you are quids in. I definitely think it's a lens that we should look into. Right then, so that is my first kind of vintage lens review on a modern mirrorless camera. If you're interested in the series and you want to see some more footage from some old lenses that you may have seen on eBay or Facebook Market or Gumtree or whatever, then this may be the series for you guys. I hope you enjoy it and I will catch you in whichever video happens to come next. Peace. Where you from? What you on? What you like? What's your song? Turn this on until dawn. It's all night. Never go wrong. Yeah, that's right. Get that drum. It's so tight. It's all right. Overseas, off that flight. That's what I like. That's what I like. I'm trying to go get my hands on that. Everyone want to get hands on that. I'm about to cop it and run that back. Run that back. All day. All day. All day. All day.